turn uh, in your Bibles to 2 Timothy chapter 3, and uh, also uh, take out your outline as well, you'll find that helpful. Now, one of the wonderful things about uh, expository preaching and uh, going through Scripture is that you know exactly where you're going to go as you're taking God's Word as He gives it. But there is a challenge to that, and the challenge to that is you've got to deal with difficult passages. You can't just skip around and think, well, I'll go here and there and we won't, we'll ignore that one, I won't worry about that. Uh, and this evening we uh, come to a difficult passage from the standpoint that it's not a very comforting passage. In fact, it's a passage of warning where Paul is dealing with the danger in the church. Not danger to the church, but danger in the church. And the danger of ignoring the gospel. Now, while Jesus said, I will build my church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it, he didn't say that it would be easy. And he didn't say the process of growing in the church would be without conflict. In fact, Jesus made it very clear that the church itself would be plagued with difficulties. And one of the main areas of difficulty that the church faces is that of false teaching and its consequent ungodliness. You see, false doctrine and ungodly living are twins. They go together, and they are the greatest enemy of the church. The church will always be, has always been, plagued by false teachers, false pastors, false preachers, and false Christians. Those who name the name of Christ say they represent God, but in fact represent Satan. They create confusion and disorder in the church. And Jesus himself, writing in Matthew 24, predicted that there would come false Christians, false prophets, and in fact, even false Christs. Now, as Paul, <clears throat> as Paul writes to Timothy, he wants to warn him about this. It's important that Timothy be alerted to the fact that he is to expect this kind of warfare. And friends, if you think for any moment that there will ever be a time when the church can just sit back and relax because the battle is finally won, you're wrong. Not until the Lord Jesus takes us to be with him will we ever get out of the war. In fact, it isn't going to get easier. It's going to get worse. Verse 13 tells us, evil men and impostors will go from bad to worse, deceiving and being deceived. It continues to accumulate and escalate as we progress between, towards the second coming of Christ. And Paul wants Timothy to understand that. He wants Timothy to know that what he's experiencing with the false teachers and the false Christians in the church at Ephesus is something that will be common to the rest of the church's history. Now, in Timothy's case, these false teachers had arisen in the church, and I think that's the context in which you have to see this particular passage. I don't think he's describing the world here. I think he's describing the character of the apostate church, of the defecting church. Uh, it's interesting that these sins named from verse 2 onwards are, of course, characteristic of the world. We see them in the world around us, of course they are. But I think the issue here is that what should be characteristic of only the world has become characteristic of the church. The leads in the church are reflective of the evils of the world, for they themselves are false. And, and I believe that this is a picture of the church and the danger that it's in, in from those who falsely represent God. Difficult times or dangerous times are coming to the church. And in fact, in verse 5, he says that these people hold to, you notice, a form of godliness. That tells me he must be referring to the church here. He must be referring to people who pass themselves off as though they represented God. They are called imposters, you notice, in verse 13, which says, again, they are pretending to be teachers who speak for God when in fact they don't. So I believe that what we have here is a picture of the battle in the church. Now, when is this battle going to begin? Well, we're told, look at verse 1, but mark this, there will be terrible times in the last days. Now, of course, the big question is, are, when or what are the last days? How are we going to recognize the last days? Well, some say that means the second coming, a time just prior to the second coming. It could mean that. But I think if you look at Hebrews 1, verses 1 and 2, it says this, In the past God spoke to our forefathers through the prophets at many times and in various ways, but in these last days he has spoken to us by his Son. 
In other words, the writer of Hebrews says the last days began when God began to speak through his Son, when the Son, Jesus, began to speak on the earth. So what that means is that when Jesus came, first of all, when he first came, he initiated the last days. So the last days means the time between the first coming of Christ and his second coming. In other words, now. We live in the last days now. We have ever since Jesus' first coming, over 2,000 years ago. This whole period, this whole age, is the last days up until he establishes his glorious kingdom when Jesus Christ returns. So what are we to expect then in the last days, i.e. now, the days that we're living in, what are we to expect? Well, we're told, aren't we, that there will be terrible times, or literally, dangerous times will set in. And the Greek word for time here is not chronological time. Uh, There's a word for that, that's chronos. It's kairos. It means seasons. And the best way to understand that in the period of the church age in which we live is that there will be very dangerous seasons that will set in, that will take place. Now, the idea of the word seasons is that there will be seasons of great danger and lesser danger. It's almost like this pulsing effect. The word for terrible here means um, a threat. It means a menace. Violent seasons will assault the church of God. And if you know anything about church history, you will know that that has been the case. All through the church age, there will be these violent assaults against the church. That's the context here. All through the church age, there will be these issues. That's the age in which we live. And as we get closer to the coming of Christ, things are going to get worse because of verse 13. It says they will go from bad to worse. The coming of Christ, they will get worse and the church faces hard times, seasons of great danger, painful difficulties. Now, these seasons come and go, but every time they come, there's an ever-increasing wickedness. So there's always a battle. It never goes away. Now, why is that? Well, very simply, it's because of ungodliness. We're going to look at this under these four headings this evening as we dig into this whole area of ungodliness. And the first we need to see is the reason for ungodliness the reason for ungodliness. And, well, it's there in verse 2, isn't it? Notice, people will be lovers of themselves. Now, the problem is, is it's because of people. It's because of what people are. There are people who will be, and then he gives you a list of the worst things you could imagine. That's the problem. The problem in the church, the battle we fight, is... It's not because we don't have good ideas or good facilities or good programs and all that sort of stuff. I'm talking about the church general here now. It's because that there are a lot of bad people who are in the church who are endeavouring to attack the church of Christ around the world. He says you've got to avoid these people. At the end of verse 5 he says, have nothing to do with them. Very strong. Now what does Paul mean when he says that people will be lovers of themselves? Well, the Greek word is made up from two words which is great. It means, it means to have affection for. Literally translated, it means to kiss themselves. That's what it means. Lovers of themselves means to kiss themselves. Uh, people who kiss themselves, people who are, in a sense, in love with themselves. And that is the sewer pipe out of which all the rest of these sins listed in verses 2 through 4 flows. It's an ugly, ugly list, isn't it? And it all flows down the pipe of self-love. It drips out of that pipe. It's the sewer of self-love that spews out all this filth. Now, misdirected love always, always releases vice. Always. If you love God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength, then you're okay. But anything less than that and you're going to demonstrate vice and wickedness. And once a person decides that the focal point of life is themselves, and he becomes a lover of self, he has just made a decision that will destroy his entire world. Because as soon as you decide to love yourself, you've just destroyed the possibility of a meaningful relationship with God. Or Christ. Or, or anybody else for that matter. Because your agenda is you. And that will violate every relationship that you endeavour to make. Now, let me tell you something. We expect that in the world, don't we? 
we expect the world's attitude to be one of loving itself. But what is frightening to me is that Paul is talking about that being a reality in the church of God. Uh, we understand it in the world. You understand why we have conflict in our society at every level, don't you? Because people who are consumed with self-love cannot make meaningful relationships. It's impossible because the only agenda is me and the only agenda is you and therefore you're not interested in me and I'm not interested in you. And you get a society of people who are consumed with self-love and you then get chaos. And we now believe in our culture that self-denial is a terrible thing. You have a world of self-love and self-esteem. You know what that translates into in most cases? Selfishness. You either love self or you love God. It's as simple as that. John Calvin, writing in the Institutes of the Christian Religion, classic treatment of theology, he says this, really interesting about self-love. He says, For so blindly do we all rush in the direction of self-love that everyone thinks he has good reason for exalting himself. There is no other remedy than to pluck up by the roots that most noxious pest self-love. That's what's so dangerous in the world and in the church because if you get a church of people who love themselves, you've just alienated everybody from everybody. Now the problem with people is they think too highly of themselves. Uh, they love themselves too much. That's a sin and it's out of this sewer pipe of self-love that all this filth that is listed in verses 2 to 4 flows. And so now I have to say, we've got to get those marigolds on and we're going to get our hands dirty because we've got to delve into this sewer pipe. Because secondly, let's look at the results of ungodliness. What flows from this love of self? Well, we're going to look at it. And I'm going to go through them because I looked at them and I thought, you know what, I could take just a general view. But you know what, as I dug into it further, I thought, let's get really mucky. Let's look at this filth. It's a horrible list. Let's look at it. Verse 2. People will be lovers of money. Isn't that interesting? Love of self leads to covetousness. You love yourself, then you want to indulge yourself, don't you? You love yourself, you want to feed your desires. You are a money lover. That's materialism. It's the same word used in 1 Timothy 6.10 for the love of money is the root of all kinds of evil. Uh, what you have is this mentality that says, I am consumed with my own self-love, and therefore the next thing is, is, well, therefore I must indulge myself. That means I'm going to love money. I'm going to covet. Now, this could be readily seen as a problem in the Ephesian church, since Ephesus was actually a prosperous city. It was a city of wealth. And because of this rampant materialism in Ephesus, it had encroached upon the church, and the church was in grave danger from it. And may I hasten to say, it's really interesting, if you notice this, False teachers are always after your money. They always want money. Why? Because they are consumed with the love of self. And what you've got encroaching on the church today is this mass of prosperity preachers who are saying, Jesus wants you healthy, Jesus wants you wealthy, Jesus wants you rich, because the two are inseparable. And one will give birth to the other, and one will feed on the other. Do you know what? I was only reading yesterday... All right, I'll put my card, I'll now my cards uh, to, on the, hold my card, whatever it is. Yes, it, yes. Uh, so Joyce Meyer, I think she's a false teacher. I was looking at how much money she earns. It is millions upon millions upon millions of dollars. She flies around in a private jet. I didn't see Jesus flying around in a private jet. I didn't see Jesus living millions and millions of uh, lots of money. He was poor and had nowhere to lay his head, did he not? Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't have the things that God gives us and provides for us and things like that, and we are blessed. And if we are, we are rich compared to many in the world, I appreciate that. But you know what? This whole gospel of prosperity that Jesus wants you wealthy and healthy and wants you rich, you know, false teachers are always, always after your money. You have a look at some of these awful channels on, on satellite, of the God channels and things like that, and you will see how often they are after your money. False teachers. And this is because of self-love. And you look at the church today, generally, and you see the encroachment of self-love, psychology, and the encroachment of this prosperity gospel. 
Only in the church today, what they're being, they're sold as things that are desirable. This is what you want. If you have lack of faith, then you won't get these things. More faith, then you're more healthy, more wealthy. Rubbish. Because Paul says they are sin and a danger if you love money. Big difference. That's how deceived the church is. That's why we're in danger. And then he moves on and he gives another pair of sins that go to sit together. Notice verse 2, he says, boastful and proud. Now the first one is boastful. This is a, an outward pride that springs from self-love. You know, if you love yourself, then you're going to boast about yourself, aren't you? And the Greek word here means a bragger. A bragger is someone who claims greatness which he does not possess. It's a good meaning, isn't it? He speaks about himself in terms that are not related to the truth or reality. He brags and he boasts about his accomplishments, overstating the truth to the degree that it has no truth for the simple purpose of impressing other people with his greatness. These are the people who parade around as if they were the heroes, the, the know-it-alls, who deceive people into thinking that they are wise, when in fact they are not. And the most important thing on their agenda is to promote themselves. There's no humility at all. They are boasters. And, of course, the companion to the boastful sin is the sin of being proud or arrogance. This is, to the inside, what boastfulness is to the outside. This is the heart that is involved in self-exaltation. The idea being that anything I do, I am motivated to do by the desire to exalt myself. That's what moves me and shapes my decisions. And then he moves on to another sin in verse 2, which is abusive. Now, it's the Greek word, blasphemio, to get the word, and you get that word blaspheme from that. And it means to be abusive in speech. It's to hurl abuse at people, to injure others with your tongue. That, by the way, is what happens to self-lovers. You love yourself, and you treat everybody else with contempt, and that ultimately ends up in verbal abuse. These self-lovers will attack and they will hurt and they will injure and they will devastate with contempt. They have no care for others. Their agenda is to love themselves and then therefore their tongues will lash out with venom towards other people. And sad to say, that is true in the church of Jesus Christ today. That there are those people who feel that in their own self-promotion they gain the positions by destroying everybody they can around them and tongue lashes, their tongue lashes out abusively against people in slander that is not related to truth or comparison. Contempt for others leads to an abusive tongue. It's a tragic thing. It's dangerous in the church. And then he adds, notice interestingly, disobedient to their parents. Hmm. I should look this direction now. No, no, I won't look in that direction. But it's interesting, isn't it? Another aspect of our sinful culture is that we have a, a generation, I'm not talking about our young people here, of course, but we have a generation of young people and children who are disobedient to their parents. And that can also and does encroach on the church. It's the sin of a society's de demise, by the way. If there is one sin that I could point to in Britain that spells the end of our society as we know it, it is a rebellious generation of children. The family is the basic point of society's preservation. And the breakdown of the family explodes the whole society. When the family goes, everything goes. Marriage as well, in fact. And disobedient are a great danger to the church. So parents, grandparents as well maybe, but certainly parents, you can't tolerate that with your children. And by the way, I found out that in Old Testament, a disobedient child could pay with their life. So watch out, everybody. But, and young people and children, you need to respond to the direction of your parents under God. But parents, you need to create an environment where that does not frustrate children, but calls them to responsibilities, to their responsibilities, that will bring them to the knowledge of God. And it's an expression of self-love, by the way, that marks this kind of rebellion. You know, when children are taught by society that the whole of life is to love yourself, then what do they care about their parents? You can't maintain the obedience and submission of your children if they're going to be allowed to believe that the love of self is the dominant need and expression of the human heart. The next word on this vile list is the word ungrateful. And this definitely flows out of self-love, doesn't it? Self-love says, I am what I am because I made it. 
Self-love says, I, get, I got there by myself. So who's to thank? Nobody, apart from myself, thanks very much. Self-love is ungrateful because it never has enough. So when, it, when is it ever going to stop and say, well, I'm grateful for, for what I have? What have I got to be grateful for? I, I never have enough yet. I haven't reached the point of thankfulness because I haven't reached the point of satisfaction. Proud, self-loving people flaunt their self-sufficiency. They flaunt their achievements. They are thankless. And then he uses the word unholy, and its meaning is interesting. The Greek word was most often used of violating the very essence of common decency. You could even translate it as indecent. You could translate it irrelevant or disrespect for that which is sacred. It it, it was something that just flaunted common decency. That's the idea of it. It, It's not being lawless or or unholy in the sense of what is revealed by God in Scripture, but really what it means is it's just what is common human decency. That's what it means here. Which then leads on to verse 3. Notice, without love. Now, what does that mean? It means that, remember, this is people in the church, that people in the church don't even have natural affection. What do I mean by that? Well, they are heartless to people who are part of the intimate circle of their life. It's not natural for me to love all of you. It's not natural for me to love God. It's not natural for me to love the unlovely. But it is natural for me to love my own family. But when people go bad, they go bad at the deepest level and they don't even love those that are, that are naturally lovable and to be loved, that is the family. So what do we have in our society today? Men and women abusing their children, beating their children, killing their children. The utter absence of natural love. Why? Well, because they are consumed with self-love, and self-love crowds everybody out. It doesn't matter who they are. So if that kid keeps screaming, when I'm trying to watch my favourite soap on TV, then I'm going to hit that kid, I'm going to hurt that kid, because that, to me, the soap matters more than that child. Because that's stopping my enjoyment of that TV programme. That's the legacy of self-love. Now, the next four words, I think, all four link together because they're very similar to each other. Notice, unforgiving, slanderous, without self-control, brutal. And he uses unforgiving, which means a person who doesn't respond to an appeal. So no matter what you say to them, they are unmovable. They will not change. They will not alter. They will not forgive. They cannot be made to agree, to give in, to compromise, to adjust, to think another person's thoughts, to see their point of view, to give themselves away on someone else's behalf. They they just won't do it. They know nothing of care, nothing about forgiveness. Remember, this is people in the church. It's, It's massive egotism. And so they become slanderous or malicious gossip. Now, the Greek word for this, really interesting, is diabolos, which is slanderous. It's the word for the devil. This shocked me when I studied this, and I hope it shocks you, but this is what it means. Every time you maliciously gossip, you take on the character of the devil. Wow. That puts gossip in a different category, doesn't it? Because, you see, Satan is a slanderer. He he speaks evil against all who represent God in Christ. He is malicious. He attacks with venom. And that's one of the sins that comes out of self-love. People who are deeply in love with themselves will destroy everybody around them in order to push themselves up, to appear better than they are in the eyes of others and make everybody else look worse. And again, this comes into the church. Malicious, slanderous diabolical gossip spawned out of hearts that are controlled by self-love. People speaking evil against other people, gossiping wickedly against them. This is the great danger in the church. You know, I've seen gossip destroy churches, relationships, ministries because of slanderous gossip. And believe me, the world in which we live is into this, isn't it? I mean, the attacks are unbelievable in our world, aren't they now? It seems like everybody is fair game. Anything wicked that can be said about anyone ought to be said and then put on the front page of, the, of, the, of some paper. Malicious acts of condemning other people that, and that mentality can get into the church. 
And instead of the church being a loving and gracious and kind and tender-hearted and forgiving, we become malicious as the world around us. We act, Paul says, without self-control. It really means we, we don't have any inhibitions. We are slaves to passion, unrestrained lust. And then he adds the word brutal in verse 3. The word basically means savage, like wild beasts. It's used to speak of a wild beast that rips and tears and violently destroys. Ruthless might be another way to translate it. So you put those four words together, unforgiving, malicious gossips without control who are brutal. Friends, this is the world around us. It shouldn't be in the church, should it? And then, really, he says, at the end, he says, not lovers of the good, Wow, imagine, no love for anything that's beneficial to others. You know, they have sunk, these people have sunk to the, the animal level, yet remain sufficiently human to at least to recognise what good is so that they can hate it. They're brutal like beasts, but at least they're smart enough to know what's good so that they can hate it. And then look at the word treacherous in verse 4. The word basically means ready to betray, a traitor. It it draws attention to this idea of disloyalty. Now, we all agree, I'm sure, when we serve the Lord, the most wonderful relational attribute in a person is loyalty. If you're serving a team, if you're leading a team, one of the greatest things is to have loyal team, loyal people in that team. Isn't it wonderful when you have someone who is loyal to you? Someone doesn't believe, perhaps, the evil gossip. Someone who doesn't believe when people say things about you that aren't true. Someone who stands by you in your failures. Someone who is there to hold you up and to pray for you and strengthen you and love you and forgive you and has loyalty. And such a wonderful grace. But the danger to the church is people who are treacherous. They get close to you in order to stick the knife in you. They want to come and talk to you and feign friendship, and then they want to take that information which they have gleaned from you, and then they want to use it to destroy you. And then he uses the word rash. These people are reckless. It it literally means headstrong. And then he adds conceited. And the root from that, from the word, the Greek word, means smoke. In other words, people who are blowing smoke, who are puffed up, inflated with their own self-importance. It's this idea of someone who has, whose head is engulfed in smoke, so he can't see reality. It's in a fog, so consumed with himself. And Paul then sort of wraps this section up with the last statement in verse 4. Lovers of pleasure rather than lovers of God. That's an appropriate climax to this list of vices flowing out this sewer of self-love, isn't it? Lovers of pleasures do not love God. Their whole life is lived in pursuit of self-love and self-pleasure. This is hedoism. And that's where we are in our world. And if you're a lover of God, you cannot be a lover of self. Because if you truly love God with all your heart, soul, mind and strength, you will be consumed with him and him alone. Now that's a horrible list, isn't it? And that's a dangerous group of people, isn't it? And remember, this is the thing. This is the shocking thing. They're in the church. We could understand, Paul, if you're writing about the world, but he's writing about the church. And there's these people that are in the church that are like this, or aspects of this. And so let's look then, thirdly, at the representatives of ungodliness. Because we see that here. The people who are bringing about this danger, who are fostering these false systems, are not only lovers of self, but they're imposters of Christianity. Look at verse 5. Having a form of godliness, but denying its power, have nothing to do with them. In other words, spiritual fakes masquerading as representatives of God's truth, when in fact they are not. Now remember, Satan is subtle. He, He never tells you the truth of who he really is, and his representatives also never tell you the truth about who they are either. They come in with a paganized form of Christianity to deceive and to basically sucker people. They are imposters. Now listen, the, the enemy of the church is not the man standing on the outside speaking against Christianity. The enemy that threatens the life of the church is the man who is on the inside, who says he's a true believer and lies. 
And so he says, they are men and women with a form of godliness but denying its power. That is, they have positively rejected its reality. They have the form without reality. The Holy Spirit is not in them. The life of God is not in them. They are hypocrites. They have no love for God. They have no love for his truth. They have no love for his people. They love themselves, remember. And so he says, very strong words, have nothing to do with them. Now, these are very strong verbs, which means fear. <coughs> the idea is strongly fear them. It means avoid them with terror, avoid them with horror, Ev avoid them because you are afraid of them. Don't have anything to do with these kinds of people, these spiritual phonies, false teachers, hypocrites, liars, who appear on the, on the scene of Christianity from season to season. They come in sacramental robes. They come with their intellectual mindset and all their degrees and their academic garb. They come in the form of orthodoxy, but they are dead and without life. They, they come with their ecumenical agenda. They come with their experiential approach to everything. Whatever it is, they are spiritual phonies. And they lead the church away from the truth of God's word. Now, how do you recognize them so you can avoid them? Well, I haven't got it on your outline. You might want to scribble these down, but... One, check their character. Check their character. Truth and virtue are two sides of the same coin, aren't they? Truth and virtue go together. So, so look at their life. If you see virtue and godliness and holiness there, uh, then they are connected to that which produces the truth, which is the Bible. Check their character. And then secondly, check their creed. What do they teach? Does it consistently square with the word of God? Are they saturated with scripture? Do they open their mouth and speak the truth of God? Or are you getting their opinion and their perspective? Do you know one of the things that I can spot about a false, a false teacher? They love to tell stories all about how great they are. Have you seen that? Heard that? They spend absolutely ages telling you about how great they are, what they've done, often humorous stories, and hardly open the Bible. Is what they are teaching contrary to Scripture, or are they keeping to what the Bible teaches? Do they misinterpret Scripture? Check their character, check their creed. Now, the reason you must avoid these people is because of what they want to do. Look at verses 6 and 7. They are the kind who worm their way into homes and gain control over weak-willed women who are loaded down with sins and are swayed by all kinds of evil desires, always learning but never able to acknowledge the truth. They are after the weak, you see here. And here's their strategy. If you want to know their strategy, here it is. They want to get into the family. They want to get into the household. They worm their way in insidiously. They, they don't come with honestly. They sneak in, and their whole agenda is to capture you, and you have to be on your guard for that. And who's their primary target? Well, look at verse 6. They sneak into households, and they gain control over weak women. Now, ladies, before you lynch me, this is not a characterization of women on a general basis. Not all women are weak women, of course not. But the women that are susceptible to these people are weak among the women. That's what it means. They're unprotected women. They're women with a unique vulnerability. Now, given the biblical definition of the role of a woman, we understand to some degree that, that women need protection. That's why in Ephesians 5, a husband is to love, to protect, and to cherish and nurture his wife. Women are to be protected. Men are to be protectors. That's how we are created and designed. It's God's plan. Women need to be cared for and protected. So when they are young, when they are, <coughs> when they are before they're married, women are to come under the protection of their father. When they are married, they're to come under the protection of their husband. When they are widowed or single, they are to come under the protection of other men in the family, or as 1 Timothy 5 says, under the church's protection. Women need that, especially women who might be weak, notice, in virtue and in truth. And that's the issue here in these verses. Women are easy prey to false teachers if they are weak in virtue and weak in truth, and they are weighed down with sins led on by perhaps lust, and always learning, notice, but never able to come to the knowledge of the truth. And false cults and isms of today always go after weak, defenseless women. Always. That's their target audience. And I don't think that we would do any justice to this injustice to this text if we were to say it's not just women. There are a lot of weak men who 
who are weak in virtue, who are weak in understanding the truth, and they are just as vulnerable. That's why it's so important that we learn truth and virtue. And so, therefore, fourthly, we see the resistance of ungodliness. The resistance of ungodliness. Really, what false teachers do is they oppose the truth. Look at verse 8. Just as Janice and Jambres opposed Moses, so also these men oppose the truth, men of depraved minds who, as far as the faith is concerned, are rejected. And in order to make this point here, Paul uses an illustration of Janus and Jambres, two interesting names, which, by the way, do not appear in the Old Testament. In fact, they don't appear anywhere but here. They were two of Pharaoh's magicians, actually. And maybe they were two of the leading magicians. You find them in Jewish tradition, which says that they pretended to become converts to Judaism and therefore joined along with the children of Israel when they left Egypt. And it was these two that led into the making of the golden calf. Now, that's just tradition. But the name uh, Janus means he who seduces, and Jambres means he who makes rebellion. So they were seducers who made rebellion against the true God. And Paul is saying that just as Janus and Jambres opposed God's spokesman Moses, so these men will oppose the truth, and sometimes they'll use supernatural things to do it. Things that can't be explained normally. In fact, they will get so good at it, as in 2 Thessalonians 2, if it weren't for God's power and restraint... <coughs> They will deceive the very elect while they're deceiving the whole world. So there are going to be some pretty deceitful people who oppose the truth. That's what he's saying. The truth preached by Paul and Timothy. You see, Satan constantly and continuously produces counterfeit preachers who claim to speak for God and do some pretty astounding things to make it convincing. We have satanically inspired opponents. Do you understand that, I hope? In fact, he describes them, you notice, as men of depraved minds. And then, of course, when tested by the true faith, they are rejected. They are unfit, unqualified, rejected cast-offs. God would never use them to speak for him and represent him. They are depraved, perverted men who oppose the truth. So there's a great danger that you need, we need to be aware of that danger. And it comes in these forms that I've talked about this evening. Now, this hasn't been a positive message, has it? I did warn you at the front end of it. So thankfully we have verse 9. Because it says in verse 9, but they will not get very far because, as in the case of those men, their folly will be clear to everyone. That's the promise of God. You want to know something? The progress of false teachers will not be able to stop the work of God. And it's a good reminder, isn't it? Because if this thing ended in verse 8, we would all be pretty depressed by now, wouldn't we? Their ultimate defeat is guaranteed, is what Paul is saying. Verse 9, their folly will be clear to everyone. Everybody's going to see it. The true church can't be ultimately deceived. The true people of God will always see it, whether present or in the future or whenever, but they will see the folly of false teachers. So it's a warning, but it's a warning that has a hopeful ending. Now, what does this say to us practically? Well, let me just give you briefly a couple of things, a couple of things to jot down. First of all, and it is this, practical things, four things. One, beware of a spiritual war. Please be aware that you are, as a Christian, in a spiritual war. If not for your own sake, for the sake of the rest of us who have to fight it, <laughs> would you be aware of it enough to pray? I mean, if you want to take a seat on the sidelines and watch, fine, but at least pray for those of us who are in the conflict. And by the way, you never sit on the sidelines because you're just waiting to be shot if you do. There is a spiritual war going on. Secondly, be theologically discerning. Be theologically discerning so that you are not engulfed in all of this false teaching and false stuff. You know, it's, I think increasingly now it's more and more important that we understand theology. It's why we teach a systematic theology course here. It's why we encourage people to come out Sunday nights and dig into God's Word together when I'm preaching to the choir because you're here. But, you know, it's important that we are theologically discerning because, you know, ignorance can come to you and can affect you and, and people are trying to just pull you away from things. Be discerning, theologically discerning. And if you're not sure about something, I always say, talk to someone who knows more than you and teach those who know less than you. That's how we work together. But, you know, so many people get themselves in such a mess because they just are not theologically aware. 
be theologically discerning. Thirdly, be pure and holy. Be pure and holy so that you're not susceptible to error. Now, you know, you can be a victim to false teachers either through the back, through the door of a lack of knowledge of truth or through the door of a lack of holiness. Either way, they can come in and they can have a negative effect on your ability to glorify God. And fourthly, be patient in the battle. Be patient. Um, we are going to win in the end. We are on the winning side. Isn't that good news? Uh, and they're going to be re revealed for, for who they are, these false teachers. They will be revealed like Janice and John Brees were now or later. I, I don't know God's timetable is for all of them. <laughs> if you're anything like me, most of them, you, you and I, we can recognize them at the moment, right now, you can. Their folly is clear. And true people of God will see that. They won't be taken in. And for those who can't see it, the time may come in this life when they do see it. It will certainly be clear at the Day of Judgment, won't it? And I think we do live in dangerous times in many ways. I think we're in an interesting season in the church itself and the things that are taking place. And therefore it's a time for us, if we're true believers, to make a stand, to stand firm on the truths of God's word. It's time for backbone, in other words. It's a time for spiritual courage. It's a time to make your life count. We are on the winning side if we love Christ. And the Lord will reward his most faithful soldiers with his most glorious reward. Let's pray. Father, there's much for us to think through this evening that we've been looking at, much that challenges us. This has not been a comfortable passage to read, but Lord, may we heed these warnings. May some of the things that we've been thinking about this evening will help us, would equip us, to be aware of false teachers and false Christians and that we ourselves would remain true to the Bible, true to the faith, not be taken in. Father, we thank you that your word reminds us that we are on the winning side, that the true church of, of Christ will never be deceived. And so we ask, Father, that you would help us to think through some of the very short but practical steps I just shared about how we can be aware and fight in the battle and not to be deceived and understand the Bible well and be discerning in theology and just being patient in the battle because we know that we will win. And Lord, now as we come in a moment around the communion table, it does remind us that through Christ we are saved, through Christ alone. And Lord, in this world where we see the state it's in, it is the cross of Christ that speaks clearly. It's a world in need. And so, Lord, we pray that we will be strong on biblical truth because if we're all over the place, then how are we going to reach a lost world? And so, Father, we pray that as we come around the communion table, help us to reflect on the things we've been thinking through. That because of Jesus, we know you. In his name we pray. Amen. We're going to sing before we come around the communion table.